So, just an added feature of using simple slides. Um, so, I'm going to start. My name is Weston. I am a full time Rails developer, Rails and web developer at Nobu. Um, it's a small startup in St. Louis Park. And I also teach Rails and web um, with Elastic Backflip. And then I'm also helping organize a meetup specifically for um, Ruby on Rails slash development. So, the people who Maybe feel a little bit shaky here, or your friends who want to learn about Rails but don't know where to start. This would be a great place to come. So we've got a February 11th meeting on March 5th. Um, invite them to come. We're on meetup. So tonight we're going to talk about Rails engines. Um, I'm assuming that you don't work with Rails metaprogramming all the time, every day. Um, I spent a month kind of digging into Rails engines, and so I'm going to share what I learned with you, some of which may be just common knowledge, um, but I'm sharing more from a beginner developer, and then sharing my experience, so it may be news to you, it may be old news, um, I'm just going to walk through what I learned. So we're going to start with kind of the basics of what a Rails engine is, um, why do we care about them, and then kind of build a very simple like scaffold object with it, so you kind of see how all the moving parts work. Um, and then finish it up with a couple of cool things, and then we'll be done. So you might be asking, what is a Rails engine? First of all, how many of you guys work with Rails engines on a daily basis, just out of curiosity? OK, just a couple. Um, so you might be thinking, what is a Rails engine? A Rails engine, in a the basic sense is an application within your main application. So if you look at the diagram, I realize this screen's a little bit far away. You get your main application where you've done like a Rails new app thing. Um, and then you've got essentially a Rails engine and a Rails engine, and you've got your own application logic in your app folder. And so the idea is that you're essentially you pulled in these other apps into your main application. And they do Rails magic for you. Um, and as you're hearing this, you might say, do people really do that? It sounds a lot like Java. All this indirection, all this building stuff. At first, when I realized what I was doing, that's what it sounded like. I'm not a Java developer. I'm really young um, in this room. <laughs> 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 We'll get you up to speed, whippersnapper. <laughs> so, from what I know of Java, which is, you know, Unza Kito, it's actually not Java. This is actually the way that you have been developing Rails for the past couple of two years, even though you may not know it. Um, so, when Rails 3.0 came along, we actually decoupled from Ruby Gems. There was a direct dependency. Um, Rails 4 did away with that. And uh, now, you interact with essentially um, gem and MVC components via Rails engine. This may be a shock, um, but the whole reason why you're interacting with a Rails engine and not um, with other things is that you want to change you want to interact with Rails during and after boot. So, um, for example, how many of you guys have set up device, um, the simple authentication library? That is actually a full-on Rails engine, and essentially the reason why is that you're plugging into controllers, you're plugging into models, and you're saying, do these things after the Rails is booted, the Rails app is booted, and we want to change how our application functions. That's a Rails app. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is, Rails engines may seem complex, but device is probably, you know, a two-second install, that's a Rails engine, so you're already using it. Um, and so, you may be saying, why should I care about Rails engines? I don't only write simple dry Ruby code that I actually need. I don't want to build bigger architecture, bigger apps, apps within apps. I don't want to do that. And I would actually, you know, challenge you, you're already using device, so you know, just learn what actually is happening, and then you can reuse it in other apps that you build. Um, and so a Rails engine at the core is just a Rails royalty with some different configurations. So here you've got um, a Rails application and a Rails engine, and the only difference is the configurations that are put on top of those inheritance objects. And so the thing that I want to hit home is that really a Rails engine is just re re reusable model view control code. So device is an example of a Rails engine, Spree. I don't know if you guys 
days of our work was free. Um, it's essentially a huge mammoth Rails engine. Um, Wicked um, is a multi-step form, plugs into the controllers, chains, switch, some things function. And so from the Rails API, Rails engine allows you to wrap a specific Rails application or subset of functionality and share it with other applications. So you're just taking MVC and you're copy and pasting in other Rails engines. That's all it is. So why should you care about this? It's not just more code that you have to write. Rails 4 actually nukes Rails 2 freestyle plugins. Um, so I don't know, have any of you gotten this deprecation warning? If you fire up an app? Um, this is what I saw all summer as I was working on a Rails engine, and so this is why the company was paying me to rewrite the code. So, a little bit of motivation for you. Okay, so we're actually going to take a simple Rails engine, we're going to kind of build it out and show you moving parts so that you, with your fantastic new idea, you want to put up on you know, GitHub and get other people coding on it, um, so you can actually go home tonight, code all night, and get it up there. Um, over the summer, I worked on a project called Questionnaire Engine, and it's essentially a Rails engine that does survey monkey type question and answer within a specific main application. So let's just dig into the code. Um, if you want to create a Rails engine, you would do like a Rails plugin QB, which is the name of the engine, and then there's all these option arguments. There's mountable, and then I wanted to skip test unit, and I wanted to create a dummy application in there. You'll see why later. And so the thing that I want to point out here is that in building a Rails engine, and it really is a Rails engine, even though it's a Rails plugin. Um, Rails plugin was just how they referred to them. This will actually create like a essentially a polymer gem. So it spits out some Rails files and then a gem spec file too. So that's it's like one way pretty much. Um, and so in building a Rails engine, you can build a full engine or you can build a not full engine. Um, and the difference is that with a full engine, you're essentially saying, I want my Rails engine to take control of whatever it goes into. So if you create a, to so you put your, your Rails engine into another application, it's going to assume controlling of the routing, of the namespacing, of how um, the boot up starts. Or you can do a not full engine, which says, I want my, my Rails engine to be put into another project, but yield the main application. This is what device does. And so it gives you functionality, but it doesn't demand control. So let's see what it looks like to actually build this out. We do a Rails generate scaffold question um, title string. So it's just a simple scaffold object. That's going to create um, a couple files in our application. And so we're just going to walk through all seven of them talk specifically to what they do, and that's pretty much it. So we're going to start out with the gem spec. Um, the idea is that you're building this Rails engine, and you're packaging it as a, as a Ruby gem. Um, it has some Rails-specific configurations, so that when it's loaded into a Rails application, it loads correctly, um, but it's packaged as a gem. So um, essentially, you're giving it configurations. You're saying, here's what it's called, here's a couple values for the, the version authors, add these files, um, here's a couple dependencies, simple um, learn gem specs. Go for it. Um, so how easy is it to make an engine that's based on another engine? So like if I wanted a full roles slash authentication, that already comes up, can can and device and everything else. If it's all in one place, is that going to be? That works actually. Does it? Um, your boot order might be a little confusing, and you have to make sure that device and can can get loaded before your Rails engine gets loaded. Um, and that's where you get into kind of meta programming, which is you know either really fun or really not fun, whatever your viewpoint is. Um, but it works. And actually, um, 
to specifically address your comment, Devise has changed its configurations or its load order to enable you to use, enable you to use fully mountable Rails engines. Um, so that you can package authentication with can can and maybe a lot of user models, like a user, and they, uh, an address, and a credit card, bundle those with device and a Rails engine and just plop it in for each of your Rails applications that you build. So if you do CMSs and you need to have authentication and you have four methods of authentication, which kind of get gnarly and you don't like copying and pasting, you can just put those in a Rails engine with device works all across all. So, and I, I forgot to say this at the beginning. I'm starting a conversation. Um, I guess because we're here and I have like 30 minutes. But feel free to ask questions. Um, yeah. It's really about. I've got an extra question. Yeah. It, it sounds like the two types uh, you've mentioned, full and mountable. Yes. It's sounding architecturally like some old stuff, like ways of doing development. One, you get a framework, and it is what you launch, and you're supposed to write pieces. Yes. Okay, that would be like full. Um, Where the engine that is full is the thing that you're and, and that's what you're going to launch. Because it wants to control, right? Right. So if you if you make a full engine, you're essentially saying, I want the full engine mm -hmm. to take control. Yeah. And then the, the mountable is the piece that you're inserting. Right. And so you've got rules on how you write uh, the pieces to go along with the full, because it's not self contained doing everything you want. You've got to write pieces that obey the documentation of the form. Yes. And the opposite would be you get to start it up and you're going to get some uh, large functionality and you have to put it in. Tweak a couple of things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's the idea. You can either insert pieces or you can insert the whole and then add. So I can see changing the name to plugin to engine, but. <laughs> Yeah. Like, 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 I assume full is the newer kid on the block? Um, maybe, I don't know. Okay. Right, and yeah, just to explicitly call this out, even though if this is a Rails plugin, you're still creating a Rails engine. Plugin just happened to be the naming convention they started with and they kept with it. And that would go along really well with the notion of something that was mountable into your stuff. Mm -hmm. Plugin. Just trying to get the architecture in mind. So, in the lib folder is actually kind of where the, the core of what makes a Rails engine a Rails engine. Um, so, if we start off here with lib QE, QE is just the name of the engine. Um, we're essentially just creating a module, a read module that we're putting all of our stuff within. So, it's almost just a namespace. And then we're requiring QE engine which is really what makes a Rails engine a Rails engine. Um, so you've got the QE module here, and then you're calling out the class engine um, inherits from the Rails engine class. Um, and then we're doing something um, the isolate namespace. This is gonna have huge ramifications in the way that we build our application. And the isolate means that you are saying, I want my main app and I want my engine to almost function as separate applications, not really to talk to each other. If you were to not have the isolate namespace, and by default it's not, if you were to take that line out, it would assume that your main application and your engine are friends and that they can talk to each other. So I started building my application as a main app and an engine with an isolated namespace, I would not do that again. Um, but we're going to take the example assuming that we have an isolated namespace. And this is where I'm not as familiar with software development, so correct me if I'm wrong, but this is kind of a service-oriented architecture. And you're saying, you're going to have one app do one thing, you're going to have another app do another, and they, they may talk to each other, but we're assuming that they can pretty much function on their own. Um, and then within the module, we just call it a version. This is mostly for Ruby gems. When you put it up there, the people know which version you have so you don't crash your app. Um, and then in the config wraps, 
Um, this is where we said we want to draw the routes. Um, and this is kind of the, one of the difference between a full and a mountable engine. Um, within a full engine, we would not do this. This is not a full engine. This is a mountable. And, it, and so what we've done here is we've said we want to, within this contextualized engine, we want to create essentially a scaffold object where you can create, read, update, and delete questions. Um, and so to pull that in to the main application, we do Rails that application, everything we've known, uh, and then we just say mount the QE engine at this route. And so this is where the mountable and full engines come in, and then the isolate namespace also has ramifications on how you pull out your QE engine routes. Um, all I can say is it's complex. I can't explain it in just a sentence. So read the documentation. There's a difference. Um, just know that. Uh, so then, because we created a, sca a scaffold object, we also created a migration. Uh, and so, as you can see, we got this migration. And the really big thing that you want to know or see is the fact that your tables are namespaced. And that's um, a, an effect of the module that you declared in the beginning. So every time you look at your models, they're going to have module QE class question. And because you have a module and then a class, it's going to assume the namespace. Um, and then one of the things I ran into, and you might, if you're transforming a plugin into an engine, is that your old plugins may have not had this namespacing. So when you write your migrations, you're probably going to you know, just start from scratch so you don't have to figure out all the differences between your old code and your new code. But when you copy in your migrations, you just want to make sure that you are enabling yourself to migrate or take legacy code and legacy schema and bring it up to your new namespace architecture. So then let's look at a controller file. Um, it's pretty much the same as you would expect with the normal scaffold object. Um, the difference though is that you've got this module um, that encapsulates all of your classes. And then here's one of the effects of the isolated versus the non-isolated namespace. With the isolated namespace, your, your essentially your path helpers or your redirects are going to be redirect for an isolated namespace, question URL, and then your question object. Whereas with an unisolated namespace, you're going to redirect to QE question URL. And the reason is that with a isolated namespace, you essentially have two routing um, rules of operation. You have your main application and you have your engine routing operation. Whereas with an unisolated namespace, your routing happens all within one um, root routing object. And so because of that, with an unisolated namespace, you have to specifically call out um, wanting to be plugged into the, the Rails engine routes rather than just my Rails app. And that's because you've mixed, you've put your, your engine and your app contextually together. And so you've mixed uh, code evaluation context because of that you have to call out the namespace. Question for you. Yeah. Will the rake routes command in either case show you all the routes? Yes. Um, and other thing I should call out is that this is Rails 2.6.11 or something. So this is not with regards to Rails 4 at all. This may hold true, may not. I don't know. So then you've got your, your model, and this is pretty standard. Um, and you've got the module that's wrapping your class, your inheriting active record. Um, it's pretty simple. It's assuming that your tables is going to be called QE questions, um, essentially using the module name that you, you called out. Um, and let's say you are trying to connect to old tables that don't have this, and your client doesn't allow you to change your schema. There's um, nice little ways that you can do self.table name equals questions, or you can add a table prefix, or do cool things. 
It's in the documentation. Just be aware that that option is available. Then the views get really tricky. And the reason why they get tricky is if you've got these helpers and this URL paths, and now they're not evaluated within a module, so they don't have the code execution context that your models or your controllers had. So that means you have to explicitly call out namespaces. Um, I was on a project where we upgraded from Spree 0.7 to Spree 1.1, and essentially they went through this transformation of adding a namespace, so all the path and URL helpers um, all the views have to be namespaced. It was a pain in the butt. Um, especially with no testing, we'll never do that. Because you, you're seriously using the app like a user and you're looking for bugs. It was not all that great. Um, How do you know what it's like to be old? <laughs>
logic into all your applications, so you don't have to code all that much. Um, and then namespacing or not namespacing determines a huge amount of difference. Um, you're probably going to bite it a couple times, and you're going to learn better. That's the only way to do it. Um, and this really sucks without tests. And so the reason is that once you put in, once you take your Rails 2.3 style plugin, copy and paste it to your Rails engine, and then you see if it works. If you have no way of testing the whole thing, you don't know if anything's broken or everything's fixed, and that's frustrating. So um, there's a couple Rails engines that I'm working on. Um, Questionnaire Engine um, actually has kind of the place where I've actively spent the most time. Um, kinetic Feedback is the application that Questionnaire Engine is being flipped into. And then Humanity is kind of a, a novel idea, cool idea for um, integrating kind of a whole thing off Rails engine. So you can just do Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. Click a button, you don't have to do the Omnia stuff, which is sometimes a pain. So, uh, tell your friends to come to the events. And that's it. Any questions?